are honored and <laughs> pleased to have Tyron Grillo, uh, translator of the Legend of the Galactic Heroes, uh, starting from volume four. He, he's translated some other um, literature from Japanese, but this is his latest project. And um, Tyron is just getting his PhD, or he's finished his PhD? Just finished, yeah. Just finished his PhD at Cornell, and uh, he's, he's on a number of translation boards and things like that. So we're honored to have Tyron Grillo with us today. Uh, thank you, John, and um, I'm very honored to be here today at uh, Kinokuniya uh, presenting my thoughts on this project. And I'm just going to start with a brief intro of the author and the series, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, but also um, some nitty gritty about the fourth volume, which I've translated, and uh, a little bit about the translation process. And then, um, assuming we have time, we can open it up to Q&A afterwards. So. All right. So author Yoshiki Tanaka, born in 1952, characterizes himself as a quiet child who read voraciously, surrounded by the iconic landscapes of his hometown of Kumamoto, Japan. Only now, he erects psychological landscapes of comparable intricacy using literary building blocks. Although one can't claim to understand fictionists from their writing, at the very least, Tanaka betrays a consuming passion for history that backgrounds every word he inks to the page. And I mean that literally, as Tanaka still writes his novels entirely longhand. He has realized his unique approach in three distinct streams. First, in a smattering of standalone novels, he examines actual events, personages, and mythologies of pre-modern China. Second, in his ongoing fantasy series, The Heroic Legend of Arslan, he transplants ancient Persian history into a kingdom of his own design. Yet, in my opinion, his masterpiece is the Ginga Eiyu Densetsu, or Legend of the Galactic Heroes. Originally published between 1982 and 1987, this series of 10 novels was adapted into both a manga and a very popular anime of the same name. And an animated reboot is currently being produced in Japan, even as plans for US distribution of the original animated series are underway in response to a growing English-speaking fan base. Legend of the Galactic Heroes meshes Tanaka's love of the past with a hypothetical future in which two warring interstellar factions, the Dictatorial Galactic Empire and the Democratic Free Planets Alliance, alternately toe the line between peaceful coexistence and gruesome entanglement. As of Volume 4, my translation of which will be the subject of today's talk and reading, the Galactic Empire is under the leadership of Prime Minister Reinhard von Lohengrin, who has grown from humble beginnings to become a power seeker of the highest order. On the Free Planet's Alliance side stands Yang Wenli, a young military commander who never deigned himself as such. Together, Reinhard and Yang constitute the binary star of these novels. As poster children of their respective politics, they are equally committed to seeing their inner ideals manifested in outer space. Reinhard is a tyrant to his core, reigning over not only countless soldiers and subjects, but also a storm of conflicting emotions. He vows to bring peace to humankind and will do anything, no matter how underhanded, to bring that lofty goal to fruition. Young, for his part, lives his life on the defensive, boarding Reinhard at every turn with affable intelligence and an uncanny nonchalance in the heat of battle, as reflected in Volume 4's subtitle, Stratagem. Where Reinhardt's galactic empire takes apparent inspiration from Germany's rise to fatal power in the 20th century, Yang's Free Planets Alliance is a hodgepodge democracy. These modes of political subsistence are at constant odds throughout the story, and it's all the civilians vacillating between them can do to commit to either side. As our omniscient narrator puts it, quote, choosing between a corrupt democracy or a virtuous dictatorship was one of the most difficult dilemmas faced by human society." End quote. If Yang's democracy is corrupt, it is not by fault of his own, but of the egomaniacal politicians fraternizing in his shadow. And if Reinhardt's impending monarchy is virtuous, 
It is only through his faith in injustice and not in how he ensures its survival. Some fans have been wont to point out fascist tendencies in the series, not least of all, given the overemphasis of Reinhard's Aryan features and Jung's non-European appearance, as imagined here on the cover of the official series handbook. But our narrator clearly sides with democracy in the end. And to that end, Tanaka prefaces volume four with quotes from two fictional historians within the universe of the series. The first reads, mutations of history and the consequences of victory are determined in an instant. Most of us live idly on as echoes of such instants as they retreat into the past. Those cognizant of them are few, and those who willfully set them in motion fewer still. Unfortunately, the latter always win the day, bolstered by armies of malice. The sidelong glance with which revolutionaries are viewed here indicates a simultaneous fascination with and critique of the will to power that drives this novel's militarism. As commanders of vast armies, Reinhard and Young both have more blood on their hands than they could ever wash off in a single lifetime. And their mutually beneficial need for action over pacifism is addressed in the novel's second epigraph, which reads, knowing the future, directly experiencing the present, and indirectly experiencing the past. Each offers its respective thrill of happiness, fear, and angle. anger. Sorry. Those who live in the past are destined to be slaves of regret. Here, allegiance to the past is condemned as a nostalgic idealism destined to be replaced by the actions of our heroes. The relationship between these two nominal extremes is therefore one of dependency over polarization. We understand that Yang Wenli, as a flag bearer of emancipation, is fraught with conflict at having to expend so many human lives to achieve it. This aligns him with Reinhard von Lohengram more than he might care to admit. Reinhard, for his part, is certain that his visions are in the best interests of humanity, that the corpses littering his, his path to conquest and absolute sovereignty are unavoidable collateral, and that any hiccups along the way only serve to valorize his interventions. As one diplomat in the novel puts it, quote, dictatorship can be a good thing, Dictators are unwavering in their beliefs and sense of duty, express their own sense of righteousness to maximal effect, and possess the strength to regard their adversaries not solely as their own foes, but as enemies of justice." End quote. At the end of the day, Reinhard respects Young's intelligence, tactical acumen, and unwavering commitment to a cause that, despite going against Reinhard's own, fuels a worthy adversary. If history is Tanaka's genesis, it is also the blood flowing through his character's emotional organs. Reinhard wants nothing less than to be a tool of history, nothing more than to be a crafter of it, and Yang the reverse. But the intergalactic deck has dealt in fateful hands, and each is left holding his cards, looking for a tell that might lend ultimate advantage over the other. As the curtain opens onto volume four, a child emperor sits on the galactic imperial throne to carry the torch of a centuries-long dynasty begun by Rudolf von Goldenbaum, a.k.a. Rudolf the Great. The Goldenbaum succession is a scourge in the worldview of Reinhard, who is now struggling to figure out how he might circumvent this promise of continued dynastic rule. When Reinhard learns of a plot to abduct the child emperor being hatched from within the independent dominion known as Faison, in classic problem-reaction-solution fashion, he turns a blind eye to its completion, thus affording him the pretext for all-out war, and, he hopes, self-nomination as emperor. Tanaka gives readers a deep understanding of Reinhard's hatred for the Golden Baum dynasty by including choice examples of its tyranny throughout the series but none so brutal as the following one from volume four, which I will share with you now. Among the Goldenbaum dynasty's succession of emperors, the most treacherous, the most treasonous rather, had been August II, otherwise known as August the Bloodletter, 
He had been taken, he had taken the throne in SE 556, or year 247 of the imperial calendar. By the time he was crowned at the age of 27, it was said he'd already known many of life's pleasures. Excessive drinking, fornication, and indulgence in fine foods had stricken him with gout, leading to a daily opium habit. His body deteriorated until it was 99% fat and fluids. His feeble bones and muscles could no longer support his massive weight, confining him to the down cushion of his electric wheelchair, on which he would transport his bulk of melting lard. Although his father, Emperor Richard III, was ashamed by the mere sight of him, August was still his eldest child and showed intellectual promise, and so the emperor couldn't bring himself to strip him of the crown. In addition, August's three younger brothers were no better in their disposition or behavior. His inauguration was met with indifference, and the greatest tyrant in the history of the Galactic Empire's court and government was only casually welcomed to the throne. August reveled in the limitless authority now handed to him like a plaything. His first decree as emperor forced his late father's favorite mistresses to transfer to his own harem. It was customary for a late emperor's concubines to be given money and to be released from their bondage, while the new emperor selected new women for himself. August's brazenness shocked his ministers and angered his mother, the empress dowager Irene. The young emperor coughed a half-smile in response to her condemnation of his insolence. Mother, I'm only trying to dispel the regret you felt over father being stolen from you by those whores, he said. Grabbing his mother's hand, he dragged her into the inner palace, his eyes gleaming sadistically. Sometime later, her ladies-in-waiting heard a woman's piercing scream. Before its echo had died, the Empress Dowager came staggering out of the inner room, collapsed to the floor, and began heaving the contents of her stomach. The metallic smell of blood assaulted the nostrils of her ladies-in-waiting as they rushed to her aid. The Empress Dowager had seen the corpses of hundreds of concubines in the inner palace. What's more, it was said they'd all been skinned alive. The deterioration of August's mind had been winning the race against his body, and the one remaining vestige of his reason had narrowed to a single thin line of sanity. But even that had vanished, the moment he'd gained unlimited power, as the new emperor's mental kingdom welcomes darkness onto its throne. From that day forth, with every wave of his fat fingers, this blob of lard clad in extravagant silk reduced the population of the capital city of Odin. His three younger brothers were all killed as conspirators to usurp the throne. Their bodies were cut into pieces with laser knives and thrown into a pit of horn heads. As the one responsible for birthing them into this world, the Empress Dowager was forced to commit suicide. Just one week after the new emperor's enthronement, not a single cabinet minister was left alive. Commodore Schaumburg of the Imperial Guard sought out so-called rebels and their extended families, including infants, based on nothing more than the emperor's quote-unquote intuition. Sentencing and repossession of assets were carried out in the so-called name of fairness, regardless of status. True to form, when executing criminals, August made sure to use extravagant, inimitable methods, and countless men and women provided him with no shortage of training materials for his innovations. Reports among the extant official imperial records pertaining to August II weren't always accurate. On the one hand, there was ample reason to cover up any stain on the golden-bound tunic, while on the other, it was necessary to record this tyrant's evil deeds by way of extolling those emperors who succeeded him. Because of this, the number of people to die under August II's reign was estimated to be at most 20 million and at least 6 million. But even the smaller figure was rarely mentioned. Like Rudolf the Great and Sigismund I before him, he wielded power as a toy, killing without reason despite his self-righteousness. Rumors of the emperor eating human flesh and drinking wine mixed with blood were clearly exaggerated. It was, however, a fact that he used a technique known to this day as August's needle to kill many an unfortunate victim. Said method involved inserting thin needles made of diamond into prisoners' eyes, piercing the skull and damaging the brain, causing death by insanity. 
For six agonizing years, the Galactic Empire groaned under the weight of his tyranny. Ironically enough, it was a time when nobles and commoners trembled in fear alike, their mutual antipathy as good as forgotten. Over time, this fear turned them into cornered rats. It took Marquis Erich von Rinderhof, August's cousin and son of former Emperor Richard III's younger brother, Archduke Andreas, to break the cycle. Seeing that the Emperor's sense and reason had jumped off a cliff into a sea of madness, and sensing imminent danger, he absconded with his life from the capital city of Odin and fled to neutral territory. In the end, August killed nearly every member of his family in the capital and, not forgetting his cousin's clever escape, demanded his surrender. Eric refused the guillotine and, with the support of a neighboring imperial military garrison, flew the banner of revolt. Eric was prepared to die for his freedom and had hidden a poison capsule in his body. In the event he was captured by the emperor, he could take his own life before his cousin could torture him to death. Despite being prepared for defeat, three young admirals, three, three young admirals rather, pledged him their allegiance. They had already deserted the tyrant, and one had lost a wife and child to the emperor's despotism. They clashed with a punitive force sent by the emperor in the Troyerbach stellar region, but easily overwhelmed their passionless enemies. For every dead soldier, 20 chose to surrender and live, and the surviving army was resigned to follow suit. And yet, even as the battle's outcome was being decided, August was dead. Knowing the end was near, Commodore Schaumburg had pushed August into his pit of hornheads as he was feeding the dogs raw meat. The emperor let out an indescribable scream on his way to the bottom of the pit, where his fat was torn by fangs and claws and digested in the stomachs of animals well fed. After an unbelievable, triumphal return to the capital amid cries of long live the new emperor, Erich immediately summoned Schaumburg, praising him for eliminating the tyrant and preventing any further harm to the people and their nation, and promoted him to full admiral. He then had an elated Schaumburg apprehended and sentenced to death by firing squad for having massacred so many people as the tyrant's trusted retainer. The newly enthroned Emperor Erich's subsequent reign was neither particularly resourceful nor civilized. Erich nevertheless earned his place in history as a ruler of great merit, by dispelling the shadow of August's terror-based politics, rescuing the emperor from a hellish state, and stabilizing the spirits of his people. But, like his descendant, Maximilian Josef, he only prolonged a despotic regime that might otherwise have collapsed, being naught but an unwitting criminal in the grander scheme of things. credit goes to Tanaka. <laughs> so, with such a colorful track record in its craw, it's no wonder the Goldenbaum dynasty should be a target of Reinhardt's disfavor. Yet, what Reinhardt may lack in the sexual violence of an August II, he makes up for in the network of men perpetrating that violence on his behalf. On that note, it's worth addressing a criticism often lobbed at Legend of the Galactic Heroes, namely its relative lack of female characters. As a quick perusal of the Dramatis Personae list included at the front of every volume will tell you, men far outnumber women in the series. That said, a closer reading proves women to be the glue of men's collusion. There is Young's trusted aide, Frederica Greenhill, whose presence and insight draw a baseline of sanity under the Free Planet's Alliance commander's militaristic dealings. There is Reinhardt's sister, Anna Rose, who was sold by their father as a sexual slave to Emperor Friedrich IV, yet another contributing factor to Reinhardt's detest for and desire to overthrow the dynasty set in motion by Rudolf the Great. Even more noteworthy is Reinhardt's chief secretary, Hildegard von Mariendorf, known affectionately as Hilda. Hilda's initiative and good counsel do, in fact, set volume four into motion. Now I'll read for you the first few pages of volume four. The year was 489 of the imperial calendar. Spring arrived late, but with a vengeance against winter's tenacious purchase, decorating the streets of the imperial capital of Odin in an abundance of flowers. The season changed, 
and those flowers withered, giving way to thick, fresh verdure as winds ushered in the first invigorating blush of summer. It was the middle of June, a time of year when temperatures across the mid-latitudinal zones of Odin's northern hemisphere were at their most pleasant. Today, however, was unusually hot and humid. Clouds drifted far above the children weaving through fields on their way home from school. The building which housed the office of the Imperial Prime Minister was made of light gray stone and boasted an air of intimidation that exceeded its purpose. Naturally, it hadn't been built for its current figurehead, Reinhard von Lohengrau. Many Imperial family members and noblemen before him had taken its high seat, exercising authority as Imperial deputies over thousands of fixed star worlds. Reinhard was the youngest and mightiest to ever hold office in its confines. Whereas his predecessors had been appointed by the Emperor, he had been the first to make the Emperor appoint him. A young woman walked through this building's hallowed corridors. Although the cadence of her step, muted garb, and pale blonde crop presented a man's appearance, her light makeup and the orange scarf peeking out from her collar betrayed this impression. As the Prime Minister's Chief Secretary, Hildegard von Mariendorf, or Hilda, had earned the reverent salute she received from Reinhard's guards, who granted her entrance into his office. Hilda thanked them warmly and sought out the handsome young Reinhard inside. The Imperial military's commander-in-chief had been gazing out the window, but swung his luxurious golden hair in Hilda's direction as she entered the spacious room. He cut a striking figure decked out in his magnificent black uniform, trimmed in silver. Am I disturbing you, Your Excellency? asked Hilda. Not at all. I would hear your business, Fräulein. I come bearing a message requesting a personal meeting from Admiral Kessler. He says it's urgent. I see, said Reinhardt. Kessler isn't that much of a hurry, is he? Ulrich Kessler, who held concurrent posts as Commissioner of Military Police and Commander of Capital Defenses, was not without fault, but neither was he one to let impatience or confusion get the better of him, as both the Prime Minister and Chief Secretary were aware. Kessler's urgency was therefore not to be taken lightly. I'll see him, bring him in, said the Empire's de facto dictator, brushing away golden locks from his forehead with slender fingers. He'd never once shirked any duty of his station, a fact not even his enemies could deny. As Hilda turned on a heel, a faint light spread its rays to the window. Thick clouds descended on the horizon, giving way to a scattering of sickly white. Thunder, said Reinhardt. The Weather Bureau is predicting thunderstorms, an atmospheric disturbance, they say, said Hilda. The faint crack of an electrical discharge in the distance approached their eardrums. The sound intensified until a hammer of light crashed down into the frame, sending legions of reinforcements in the form of raindrops across the window panes. Following this, Reinhard lends an ear to Ulrich Kessler, who informs the Prime Minister of the secret plot to abduct the child emperor. When Kessler is dismissed, Reinhard consults Hilda on the matter. After seeing Kessler out with a promise of further instructions, Reinhard returned his gaze to the sky, now clamoring with thunder and lightning. I suppose you know an imperial historian once compared Rudolf the Great's angry bellows to thunder, Fräulein von Mariendorf. Yes, I do, she said. Quite the simile. Hilda avoided an immediate reply, instead studying the elegant figure of the young Prime Minister, whose solemn attention extended well beyond the window. Hilda heard malice in Ryan's hard voice. As for this phenomenon we call thunder, he said, his regal features glowing in a flash of lightning. Its energy is wasted the moments it's used, he continued. It gives off a tremendous amount of heat, light, and sound, but rages madly just for the sake of it. That's Rudolph the Great to a T. Hilda opened her shapely lips but closed them without a word, guessing her answer was furthest from Reinhardt's mind. But not me, he said. I'll never be like him. Hilda felt those words being directed partly to Reinhardt himself, partly to someone who wasn't in the room. As this altercation, or rather conversation, goes on, Reinhardt confines, confides in Hilda about his growing dis-ease of impending events, but trust her counsel as she gives it. 
As indicated by this scene and made explicitly clear in my soon-to-be-published translation of Volume 5, Hilda is more than a sounding board for Reinhardt's intended action. She is, rather, the indispensable catalyst bringing his grander scheme to light. And while gender differences seem to have changed little in the many centuries leading up to the events taking place herein, one can hardly expect them to have done so when history is still being written, performed, and edited by descendants of the same men leaving their own trail of droppings in the forest of our current century. And why, these books implicitly ask, would any woman desire to receive to such levels of power if only to repeat the mistakes of the men whose tainted authority they would be usurping? The master's tools, as feminist Audrey Lord would have reminded us, will never dismantle the master's house. One must also consider that until this point in the series, Earth has been something of a non-variable, meaning that societies are bound to replicate the mistakes that led to Earth's downfall in the first place. Despite being the birthplace of civilization, the only ones eking out a meager existence below Earth's barren surface, ever since a global thermonuclear war and interplanetary exodus left it for dead, are followers of a cult known as the Church of Terra, who've anointed our abandoned world as the seat of universal theocracy. In addition, Tanaka goes to great lengths to show us that his male protagonist's egos are full of holes. To that end, this volume in particular hangs a gallery's worth of psychoanalytical portraits. Reinhard struggles to bring peace to the known universe, as also to his grief, which clings to the death of a dear friend, Siegfried Kirchheis, with whom he will never share spoils of conquest. Meanwhile, Yang dreams of being an armchair scholar, despite knowing he is destined to slaughter his way into the future. Furthermore, there is Yang's ward, a teenager by the name of Julian Mintz, who came to be in Yang's service under a military law that placed war orphans in the care of other veterans. Julian's own grappling with identity and masculinity leads to some of the book's savviest exchanges. When, for instance, Yang learns that Julian is to be sent to the independent dominion of Faison as a military attaché, thus separating Julian from Yang for the first time since their friendship began, Yang steals himself for the boy's departure by fielding his thoughts on matters of political relevance. Yang sat himself down on the garden bench next to an inconsolable Yulian, who lifted his head to see Yang with a can of beer in his hand and an imposing look on his face. Admirable, or sorry, Admiral. He is admirable too. Admirable. Admiral, said Yulian. Uh, hey, you mind if I sit here? Said Yang. Help yourself. Yang sat down somewhat awkwardly, pulled the tab on his beer, gulped down a lump of foam and liquid, and took a breath. Look, Julian, yes, Admiral? I'm only sending you to Faison because I was ordered to, but if you ask me, having someone on the inside that I can rely on might not be such a bad thing. Either way, I'm sure you'd rather not go. But the way things are going, said Julian, Iserlone is headed for the front lines again. I think I'd be of greater use here with you. I honestly wouldn't see the point, Julian. Yang tossed back another swig of his beer and looked at the boy. Everyone is expecting the Imperial Navy to invade by way of the Iserlone Corridor, although neither protocol nor law demands it. But if that's the case, said Julian, then where would they invade from? Will they make some grand detour beyond the solar system? The Faison Corridor is all that's left. You're right. Julian gasped at Yang's easy response and waited for an explanation. For Duke von Lohengram, no tactic could be more effective than laying siege to Iserlone with one fleet while breaking through the Faison corridor with another. Odin knows he has the resources to pull it off. Iserlone will be isolated, reduced to a little, to little more than a pebble on the side of the road. But then wouldn't the Empire make an enemy of Faison? Good question, but I wouldn't count on it. The way I see it, Duke von Lohengram has two options if he's going to pass through the Faison Corridor. One would be to eliminate both Faison's overt and covert resistance by force. The other would be to bypass Faison's resistance altogether. Yang explains no further, but Julian knew what the black-haired commander was hinting at. 
Are you saying that Duke von Lohengrim and Faison are secretly working together? Precisely, said Young. Young raised his beard to eye level, commending the boy's acumen. Julian, sorry, Julian couldn't afford to feel glad about being praised in this case. Collusion between Duke von Lohengram and Faison meant the unification of the greatest military and economic powers in the galactic system, and their spears were sure to be aimed at the Free Planets Alliance. Julian had grown used to the prevailing political and military conditions, but now he was drastically revising his mental diagram of an opposing empire and alliance within Faison, equidistant between them. It was a lot to take in in one sitting. Julian, said Young, we humans are hardwired to fall into these kinds of misunderstandings. But think about it for a moment. The Galactic Empire didn't exist 500 years ago. The history of the Free Planets Alliance is half that length, and Phazon is barely a century old. Anything that hadn't existed since the dawn of the universe probably wasn't going to be around for sunset. Change was the way of things. As manifested in the, in the outstanding character of Duke Reinhard von Lohengram, Change had swept through the galactic empire and was now spinning its web to ensnare human history. Does that mean the galactic empire? No, the golden bound dynasty will crumble? It will. In fact, it already has. True political and military authority are in Duke von Lohengrim's grip. The emperor has abandoned his country and his people, and even if the name hasn't changed, the Lohengrim dynasty is already upon us. I'm sure you're right. But I wonder, is the probability of Faison having not allied itself with Duke von Lohengrim really that high? asked Julian. Young responded, imagine you have three major powers, A, B, and C, and that A and B are in a relationship of mutual adversity. In this case, C's best course of action would be to save A if A was being threatened by B, help B if B was being pressured by A, or simply prolong the conflict between A and B until both sides destroy each other. But if A's influence strengthened dramatically so that even with B's help, C would find it difficult to oppose A, wouldn't C be better off attacking B in cooperation with A? But say it did, said Julian, and the overwhelmingly fortified A capped off its victory of destroying B by attacking C, wouldn't C be heading from independence into certain doom? The young, dark-haired admiral looked at the flaxen-haired boy, impressed. Yes, that's exactly right, and the crux of where I'm going with this. In offering its wealth and strategic position to Duke von Lohengram, perhaps Faison will lose its independence. And how are they planning on getting out of that situation? So as you may hear from the selections I've chosen to share with you today, translating even one dialogue from Legend of the Galactic Heroes isn't always an easy task. But while it wasn't uh, intimidating for me to jump into a series so late in the game, the first three volumes having been lovingly translated already by Daniel Huddleston, and not least of all for juggling an extensive lexicon of military terms, character names, and backstories, once I sat with these characters and let them speak to me, I began to hear their voices as individuals. The result is by no means perfect, but is something I'm proud to have been a part of nevertheless. What I have made a matter of difference in my renditions, however, is bringing across the author's matter-of-fact register. Tanaka treats these events as a matter of record. Consequently, in my translation style, I tried to strike the unembellished tone of a history textbook all while maintaining, I hope, Tanaka's flashes of poetry and philosophical sensitivity. Maintaining this integrity believably was my biggest challenge, and it is my sincere hope that aficionados of the series will appreciate this pared-down approach. More than anything, I want readers to feel Tanaka's way of reimagining the past by substituting it with a speculative future of his own as not simply a means to his narrative ends, but as a way of commenting on the present sandwiched between those two chronological extremes. It is, in other words, impossible to read Tanaka without seeing how far humanity has reached and fallen vying for power. Toward those who naively salivate over the crunch of forbidden fruit between their teeth, Tanaka shows empathy without mercy, and in this volume, perhaps more than any preceding it, 
provides a poignant reminder that sometimes fiction, by whatever relevance we are willing and able to read into it, hits closest to a reality from which we might otherwise wish to escape.